Top-down mixing is my go-to mixing strategy because it solves two big mixing problems people face when they're learning how to mix. This video also kicks off a new series here on the channel called Speedy Sessions, videos designed to help you get fast in the studio. This is who I want you to be. Yeah. Well, why this focus on speed? Well, because the faster you are, the more music you can make. And I've found I make better music when I make music quickly. Leave a comment below, let me know if you like this type of video and you wanna see more. Okay, so in this video, we're gonna talk about what top-down mixing is, how to set it up on your sessions, and you'll get to hear for yourself how you can mix entire chunks of your mix with just one or two plugins. It's wild. So what is top-down mixing? The name isn't super helpful. Think of it like a pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid, the most important part of the mix is the mix down itself. So the stereo mix bus, the master fader, the main output. That's the final destination for all the tracks. And we're taking all of these tracks and we're eventually gonna put them all down to a single stereo audio file, right? That's our mix. Now, a lot of times in between the tracks and the mix, we might have something called buses. We may have a bus for our drums, a bus for our guitars, so on and so forth. Now, on really small productions where you only have a handful of tracks, really you don't need the buses. So if it's just maybe you know five or six tracks, you can just go tracks directly into your mix bus. In those instances, top-down mixing really isn't applicable, so don't worry about it. However, if you've got a whole bunch of tracks, drums, bass, guitars, vocals, background vocals, keys, glockenspiel, whatever, those bigger sessions really benefit from top-down mixing. I don't love the term top-down mixing because it seems to imply that we're sending everything up to the mix, but I think of it more linear. I'd like to take that pyramid and like dump it over on its side. Something like this. We've got tracks, feeding buses, buses feeding the mix. So there's a very clear left to right linear workflow problem is even though the signal is flowing from left to right what gets better results and faster results is actually processing them in the exact opposite direction so instead of starting your mix on the individual tracks like kick snare overhead you're, you're starting over at the mix or at least at the buses and then working your way back that's the essence of top-down mixing the mix is over here it is technically the top and then we're working our way down to the bottom of the pyramid. Instead of top-down mixing, I honestly like to call it backwards mixing because we're beginning further down and working our way back to the beginning. Here's what that can look like in a session. So here's a big session in Studio One. Uh, all these blue tracks are my individual tracks. These red tracks here are all my buses, and then this green track is my main output. There's decidedly, if we expand it out, you can see it a little more clearly, all the blue tracks are eventually feeding into these red tracks, and then all of these red tracks eventually feed into the main mix bus. It's an easy way to kind of delineate separation between tracks. So I'm really, when I think about mixing, I'm not thinking about these, I don't even know how many there are, 52 tracks in this session. I'm really thinking about these these uh, eight, 10 or so buses that I've created. I just have to get these 10 buses to play together and I've got myself a nice mix. It's a much easier way to think about it, also produces better results. So now you know the basic tenets of top-down mixing, but it's more than just a routing scheme. It's really a philosophy, a way of working that in my mixes has yielded really great results. Question of the day, do you use top-down mixing? Have you tried it? Do you like it? Why or why not? Leave a comment below and let us know. Earlier I said top-down mixing solves two big problems. What are those problems? The first is huge. It's slow mixes. This plagues musicians when they're trying to learn how to mix and they're excited, they record some stuff, it sounds great, then they get to the mixing and it's like they've stepped in glue and it just takes them forever to get from I've started mixing to hey my mix is finished. Some people never get to hey my mix is finished, they just stay stuck in this cycle of just randomly twisting knobs and trying to just make things sound good with no order and no purpose, no rhyme or reason. It can be really frustrating. And I would argue it's probably one of the leading causes of people giving up on producing music altogether. It's because mixing seems like such like a dark forest that you go into and never come out of. Top-down mixing helps solve that problem. How? Well, like I said before, it's intuitive to us to think if I'm gonna start mixing, I'm gonna start from the left and work my way to the right. We read from left to right, 
in English at least, makes sense we would go left to right following the signal flow. I'll tell you a story. When I first started learning how to mix, I would sit down. I remember this clearly. I would sit down in my living room, uh, have my headphones on, my little computer rig there, and I would start with, it was a traditional kind of rock and roll song, so drums, bass, guitars, vocals, keys. And I would start with the far left track, kick drum, and I would solo that sucker, and I would just sit there with my bowl of popcorn and mix that kick drum for as long as I wanted. EQ, compression, gating, maybe sample replacement, like just doing all sorts of things to that kick drum. And then once I get it sounding like, that sounds like a good old kick drum, then I would move over one to the snare drum, and I would solo the snare. Everything else is muted, now I'm working on the snare. So I'm doing all the tricks people have told me. I'm trying distortion, I'm trying parallel processing, I'm trying you know EQ, compress, and then EQ, or compress, and then EQ, and then EQ again. I'm doing all sorts of crazy cool advanced things on my snare drum. 30 minutes later, I'm happy with the snare drum. Now I go to the next track. Can you see how that would take forever? Now you might say, okay, it takes forever, but A, won't you get faster at it? And B, even if it takes forever, won't it sound great when you get to the end? The answer to that second question is no. Yeah, you'll get faster at dialing in tones just from experience, but still, even if you go through every track and only spend five minutes on them, that's a long freaking time to get to the end only to find that it doesn't sound very good. That's exactly what happened to me. I would do this over and over and over again. I would mix one track at a time, get each track sounding great. Then by the time I got to the end of it, you know, hours later, I would unmute everything and listen, and it just sounded like hot garbage. It was like, okay, it doesn't sound any better than it did hours ago before I put plugins on there. What is going on? And my only solution was to delete all the plugins and start back at the beginning. I must have done something wrong in the individual processing on the individual channels. Can you see how that would make mixing take for freaking ever? Yeah, there's a better way. Rather than honing in on the kick drum, I hone in on the drum bus. I treat the drums as a whole. Then I hone in on the bass bus, if there's more than one bass track. Then I hone on in on the guitar bus the keyboards bust, the background vocals bust. I treat them as these big entities. And a lot of times, a whole lot of times, I end up getting a great drum mix by just putting some stuff on the drum bus and not even touching the individual tracks. Not to say we don't touch the individual tracks, but we don't touch them first, usually. We get a great sounding mix at the drum bus, and then we see, okay, where are some problems, little individual things that we can solve on the per track basis, but the bulk of the tone came from the bus itself. The second problem that top-down mixing solves is over mixing. It's, it's natural, it makes sense, but it can really bite you when it comes to mixing. If you're looking at one track at a time, you might say, well, I'll put you know, distortion, saturation, compression, EQ, reverb, delay on that track. Why not? And then you make similar decisions times 20, 30, 40 tracks, you end up with a session with a whole boatload of plugins. And the, the, the amount of plugins isn't really the problem. It's the amount of processing that's there. When I hear mixes, and I've done hundreds and hundreds, probably approaching thousands of mix critiques over the years, one of the big mistakes I hear is I can hear the processing. When I listen to your mix, I don't feel like I'm hearing a cool song. I feel like I'm hearing your mix and then the song is hidden somewhere underneath because people tend to overprocess. They tend to do too much. Top-down mixing doesn't solve that by itself, but it really makes it less likely because you're only putting plugins in a few spots, at least early on in the mix, versus slapping a plugin on every single instrument. But that's enough talking. Let's listen to what it sounds like in real life. Here are some drums that I recorded for one of my songs. These are the raw drums with no plugins. Here's what they sound like. Now I'm going to add two plugins to that drum mix. These are going directly on the drums bus. The first will be just a basic old compressor, which is set up to do that amount of compression there. Nothing crazy, but it's pretty aggressive. Fairly slow attack time, release time about 95. And then the second plugin is EQ. This is just getting rid of some of the boxiness here in the mid range, spiking up the 
crack of the snare a little bit here, and that's it. So with those two plugins, let's listen to what all that does to the drum mix. I'm going to play it for you, and I'm going to click this button here to turn the plugins on and off. So you'll hear both the compressor and the EQ engaging, and then turning back off. We'll start with it off, and then I'll turn it on so you can hear what it's doing. Now, is it completely mixed? No, there's probably some work we can do. That's probably too aggressive on the compressor. I would dial that back in the mix probably, but hearing it in the mix might change my mind. But that is just two, two plugins that got our drums a, if not all the way there, then a big chunk of the way there. Now I could go in and do some specific things, maybe on the snare drum, maybe on the toms, to kind of massage those into place and get them sounding exactly how I want them to sound. But the bulk of my tone is coming from these two plugins. Now that's just the stock compressor and EQ. What's really fun is when you start using cool analog emulations that add some character and thickness and warmth and all those buzzwords that we love, then it starts to get really interesting. And I was able to do that it took me, you know, 60, 90 seconds to set up those two plugins, and I've already got my drums most of the way mixed. How much faster is that than the alternative of doing EQ and compression on every single track? For the second example, I'm going to show you how I would do this in real time. So I'll actually add the plugin while we're listening to kind of show you the process. But these are a bunch of background vocals that I've recorded. There are 10 of them. Imagine processing each of them individually. Who would do that to themselves? But here's what they sound like raw. This really hammers home the way I think about this whole top-down mixing. I don't think about this as, oh, I've got 10 background vocals. I really, in my mind, think of it as a keyboard part. I just needed to record 10 tracks to get the notes that I wanted, but I'm going to treat that as if I had played a choir patch on my keyboard. How do I do that? Well, for me in this instance, it's probably just EQ. On that background vocal bus here, and we're going to go roll off some low end, probably going to pull out some of this mid-range just to make it nice and airy. Let's see what that sounds like. Supposed to be Got rid of a lot of the low mid energy that was making it kind of go whoom, 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 uh, which you don't need in a mix. Almost never need that in things like background vocals. Let's get those out of the way. Let's let guitars and drums and bass handle the low end. Uh, but this will sit really nicely across the top of the mix. Here it is without. Amen. Here it is with. And if we decide we want to put some reverb on there, because of course, why not? I've got reverbs already set up in my session. I just add my big plate reverb to that, adjust the volume, and... Two moves. Three moves on the EQ, and then add a reverb, and our background vocals are mixed. That is at least 20 times faster than going through and doing each one individually. So where does top-down mixing fit in our mixing workflow? For me, it's step four in my five-step mixing process. Step one is the mix setup, which involves getting all those buses ready to go. Step two is the static mix. Step three, we fix big problems in the tracks. Step four is top-down mixing. And then step five is the to-do list method, which is how we know when our mix is done. If you want to dive deeper into each of these five steps and learn a little bit more about how to incorporate those into your mixing workflow, I've got a free five-step mix guide that you can have just go to five step mix.com to download it today by the way you want to know what else top down mixing is good for yeah it helps with your mixing process for sure getting faster and better but it also helps you become a better producer because once you start working from the back of the mix working back to the front you'll realize how important the raw tracks themselves are you can't really effectively do a good top-down mix if the tracks are hot garbage and need all kinds of work just to get them sounding halfway decent when i started incorporating top-down mixing into my workflow my recordings and productions got better because i realized 
how much emphasis I was putting on the mixing process to fix all the bad mistakes I made in the recording process. Once I went backwards even further into the recording and the production phase, I fixed those problems at the source and my mixes just took off from there. Like most things in life, top-down mixing isn't the only way to mix music, but I've seen it work for thousands of people helping them transform their mixes, so it's at least worth an evening of your time to try it out for yourself and see if you like it. If you like this video, you'll love this video where I share 19 mixing tips I wish I knew 20 years ago. Go check that out. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.